birthing and raising, nurturing, praising. She's love and she's given, yet she's omitted from history. Overlooked, underestimated. Still she rises. Still she changes everything. There is no arrival, no all hail the king, no victories are conquest, without unsung claims. If not for a woman, if not for a woman, if not for a woman, if not for women, if not for me, if not for me, if not for me, where would we be? Shed. Um, we've made it through Thanksgiving, and Advent is here. It's officially Christmas music time. I listened to it after Thursday. Some of you are like, we've already been listening to this for weeks or months, maybe, but um, I'm just jumping on the bandwagon. But it is that first Sunday of Advent. It's this season where we sit in the tension of hopeful expectation, but also the realization that we still have so far to go. We're on week three of our Christmas series, If Not For A Woman, where we're listening to and learning from femme voices in our community. For those who are like, who the heck is this chick? Yes, I got here right before COVID kind of separated us and shut us, shut us all down. But my name is Blair and I get the opportunity to be part of this staff team and to work with kids and to be part of Shed Village for this year. Things that, things that I never a year ago even knew might be possible. So I'm excited to be standing up here with you this morning. And I'm honored to have this Britney Spears microphone, as I call it. Um, and I just can't wait to share more of my story with you. I'll be honest, though, whenever I was asked if I wanted to speak, two things immediately popped into my head. The first was, Psh, I got this. I come from a long, a long line of strong women. You know, my mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmothers, my aunts, they are all women whose strength has formed me and impressed me and transformed me for my whole life. They are women who have had to, to walk through alcoholism, addiction, selfishness, early deaths, single parenting at times, toxic masculinity at times. And so I'm grateful for that. But I'll be honest, the second thought that came to my mind was, who wants to hear what I have to say? You know, Mary was engaged whenever we look at this passage, not me. Mary was pregnant, still not me. <laughs> An angel showed up and chatted Mary up. And to my knowledge, no Gabriels have showed up in my dating app yet. But excited and honored, I just was overwhelmed with the layers of emotion. So on the outside, I smiled confidently and committed to be up here this Sunday. But in my head, I was freaking out, if I'm honest. Do I really have anything of value to add to this conversation? You should know about me that there's this tape that plays constantly in my head over and over, telling me that my voice, my presence, my wisdom, my experiences are irrelevant in this world. And most of that is because I'm a female with no partner and no kids of my own. And you know what? I have a sneaky suspicion that I may not be the only one that has a tape like this playing. So this morning, I'd like to tell you a little bit of my story. When I was younger, my family had a kitty table at every single family gathering. Every Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, birthday, you name it, there was this special table that was set up for us. Maybe you all had that table at your house too. 
And it felt so special. We felt so cool until we realized that everybody was eating with real silver except us. We had plastic. We were like, what is happening? So my 13 cousins and I sat at this table together for every holiday until we started to get married. And once we were married, we were invited to move up to the grown-up table. While it was a well-intentioned idea to have a kitty table, my grandmother has thankfully shifted to an open table where we all sit together, no matter our age or our marital status. Then if you zoom into my immediate family, my parents, my siblings, step-parents, their families, I'm the only child who isn't married and doesn't have any children. So planning typically happens with a priority placed on everybody else's schedules. I mean, it's understandable, right? I'm not unreasonable. They definitely outnumber me. And I know that my family loves me deeply. I don't question that. But it's still a little painful. Just because I'm not married and haven't started a family yet, I tend to feel like I'm last on the list when things get planned. And apparently, if that's not enough, I just love a challenge because not only is this feeling present in my personal life with my family, but I also hold space for this in my professional life. I chose a male-dominated profession in the Bible Belt. What was I thinking? What woman in her right mind chooses to jump into a pastoral role in a sea of white men? It's me. (laughs) And I'm sure you're thinking, dang, those Southern Baptists and their sexism. But the reality is that even for churches and families that choose to accept me as female pastor to their kids, there's still some doubt. I mean, how do I know anything? I've never had kids, right? Then I think about Mother Teresa, Queen Elizabeth I, Marie-Sophie Germain, Oprah, Jane Austen, Florence Nightingale, Susan B. Anthony. Who the heck would turn any of them away just because they've never had kids? Also, I will put a little plug in here. My sister and her husband have gladly shared their five kids with me. Some might call it a lack of boundaries, <laughs> but I just see it as a co-parenting experience that I get invited into. So I don't know if you're seeing this trend in all the layers of my life, but it's there, this feeling of not feeling valued. Then you add in my middle child syndrome of always feeling left out, and then my Enneagram 6 this fear of abandonment, and boom, I find myself questioning my value in my family, in my job, in the church, and in the world. Am I wanting special treatment? No. Are my expectations too high? I don't think so. No matter how much I know, how accomplished I am, or how much I care deeply for people, there are so many questions that run through my head. But if I'm honest... The underlying questions that never go away are, am I irrelevant without children? Is that all there is to this life? Is there hope to the one who feels like they don't check the right boxes? Is there hope for the outsider? Let's pause here on my story and go to the book of Matthew. How does Matthew introduce Jesus? Matthew is one of my favorite books in the Bible. The author includes some great stories. The Sermon on the Mount is in there. There's, there's this constant picture that's being painted in the book of Matthew about this upside-down, backwards community that Jesus came from. The Gospel of Matthew has this beautiful theme of outsider is insider. And it starts at the very beginning with Jesus' genealogy and infancy narrative. Dr. Jennifer Garcia Bashal, who was here a few weeks ago, she argues in her book that this is where the author lays the foundation for Jesus' ministry. And this is where there's this idea that God's kingdom is being strengthened by the outsider. 
side note slash shout out, I, I do want to say that Dr. Bashal shared an advanced copy of a chapter of her book that she's writing. So if there's anything really good that I say, it probably came from her. <laughs> So on the screen, there's actually, we're going to share the genealogy of Jesus. I'm not going to read it to you, but I think it's really cool that this is where this story starts. It starts with some family history. So many readers, so many of us are so quick to skip over the family tree, but there are layers and layers and layers of meaning here down to the number of stanzas and the number that's represented, that number 14. Matthew is also stirring the pot with his choice of who to spotlight. Most Hebrew scriptures trace generations through the males, but not Matthew. He includes women and not just any women, but women that were non-Israelites, foreigners. Oh my. And they're not just any women. They are bad ass. Tamar was widowed and fought for her family rights denied to her. Rahab was a prostitute who hid spies. Ruth was from the country that was Israel's sworn enemy. Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, was likely an immigrant. Matthew wanted us, the readers, to know that from the very beginning... Jesus was from a blended heritage, but also Jesus was for everyone, not just Israel. And Matthew went even further to say that anyone who wanted to be part of this new type of kingdom, this upside down, backwards thinking world, would need to embrace diversity in the same way that Jesus did. After the genealogy of Jesus, Matthew continues to reference the foreigner. Radical inclusion is a key theme here as we meet the wise men who come from afar, a.k.a. more foreigners. Then there's the story of these two parents who become refugees, leaving the only place they've ever known and risking everything they have with a toddler. Then it gets even worse. The next thing you know, Matthew is telling us about children who were slaughtered, toddlers, Children who never got to grow up. Oh, how brokenhearted those mothers and fathers must have been. Herod was not a nice guy. He was evil, power hungry, greedy. And we ask, why does Matthew need to include this? And the answer is because we need to understand the world that Jesus was entering into. A world where corrupt rulers have the power to cause great suffering. A world where families are losing everything they've ever known just to stay alive. A world where innocent children are suffering. Matthew reminds us that this story is about so much more than just a baby. There's hope in this new world that Jesus came to create. Jesus came to protest and revolt against oppression. Jesus came to challenge corruption. Jesus came to dethrone the practices and priorities that put people like Herod in charge. People who are willing to do whatever it takes to get rid of anyone that threatens their status. God, Emmanuel, had come to dwell with us because we as humanity then and now have the responsibility to announce that hope in this corrupt but correctable world. This story of Jesus is about something new being born. And we're not just talking about a baby. From the darkness comes a change in power structures that overlooked have a voice. These are signs of God's new world. And we, God's people, step into this place where we are transformed. 
this place where our eyes are opened, where we wake up, this place where we realize how connected we are to the rest of humanity and society, this place where we realize our calling to feel loved and to love others, this place where we realize we have the opportunity every moment of every day to bring about this kingdom that God constantly talks about. Maybe you're like, oh, this is so sweet. Let's hold hands and sit around the campfire and sing Kumbaya. Or maybe you're like me and you're saying, I'm all in, but give me a checklist. Give me some direction. Give me some expectations. My math brain needs this. So what does this kingdom actually look like? When we read Matthew, we see that this kingdom is about the least being the greatest, affirming everyone's value, speaking out, listening more, experiencing rhythms of rest, sharing leadership, and an absence of stereotypes and abuses from the world. It's about full participation David and I had a conversation this week, and he said, this kingdom is a universal non-belonging, which I love. It's the voiceless being given a song, and the rest of the world is finally listening to it. Sarah Bessie, in her book, Jesus Feminist, puts it this way. The kingdom of God is a gorgeous, crazy family that listens and talks too loud And loves you all the harder in your weakest moment. It's art and co-creation. It's giving our money away. Because there's a bigger treasure in giving than in hoarding. It's provision. It's enough. It's a welcome. You, yes you, are welcome here. We've been waiting for you. So I ask you this morning, who are you not seeing in your life? in your family, in your community? Who has a song to sing and you're not listening? Who are you sitting at the kitty table? Because them sitting with you at the grown-up table means you have to watch what you say. You have to filter yourself. You have to actually work to be inclusive. There's no kitty table in the kingdom of God. There's just this never-ending table for all. There's no value placed on one voice over the other. There's a deep understanding that we are less without each other. I am less without you. So if not for a woman, if not for a single woman, if not for a childless woman, if not for moms, if not for dads, if not for a man, if not for people of color, if not for indigenous people, if not for whites, if not for transgenders, if not for gays, if not for lesbians, If not for non-binaries, if not for a Republican, if not for a Democrat, if not for imperfect parents, if not for children, if not for teenagers, if not for those with special needs, where would we be? Look around. We're here. We keep setting up the kitty table. We keep separating ourselves from those who see the world differently. Those who haven't opened their eyes to see certain things. Until we really embrace that an open table makes us stronger, we will continue to repeat those patterns of Herod. Those toxic patterns of selfishness and insecurity. The patterns of step on whomever I need to so that I can get to or stay at the top. 
those patterns where our fists are clenched so tight because our status or power feels threatened. We will continue to cause heartbreak and pain and worthlessness in ourselves. We will continue to hurt other people intentionally and unintentionally. We will continue a world where corruption and selfishness take over in ourselves and in our society. This Christmas story is about so much more than a baby. And so is my story. And so is your story. This story is about hope for the outsider. Hope for the misunderstood. Hope for a world where the divine has come to dwell with us because you and I are worth dwelling with. This hope is this new world that's being born. This new world where we together challenge these power structures and leaders that oppress. Hope in all of our voices creating a beautiful melody. Not just spotlight on the soloist. It's hope in being transformed through our struggles and through awakening. This hope is realizing that we are sacred and have always belonged the table this hope is us all feeling at home together Adrian Michael Green published a poem this week about the idea of home this hope he said go where your fullness is celebrated go where your heart feels at home go where your everything is validated go where your sorrows are held Go where your body is respected. Go where your giving is sacred. Go where your days are listened to. Go where your quiet isn't judged. Go where your inner peace is considered. Go where your love language is understood. Go where your person is applauding you. Go where your spirit rises and rises and rises. May you and I be people who create this place because this is the kingdom of God. May we, Watershed, be people who are people of hope and home to this corrupt but correctable world. Grace, peace, and happy COVID holiday season to all of you. I, we, would be less without you in our community and world.